Welcome, everybody, um, to Making Your Library More Reliable with Fuzzing. My name is Marshall Clow. Um, we'll be here for 45 minutes, and then we'll break for lunch. OK, about me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been doing this for a while. Um, I've been a member of Boost for oh, more than 15 years. Um, I've written a, written a library or two. I maintain a few others. Most of my efforts these days work on libc++, which is a standard library implementation for LLVM. Um, I'm also with Boost. I, I was on the steering committee for a while. Um, I'm one of the release managers. I um, admin some of the mailing lists as well. But that's not why you're here. OK, so we'll start off with what is fuzzing? Fuzzing is a way to find problems in your code. OK, it's, it's a predicate. It's predicated on the idea that CPU cycles are cheap. Cheap, excuse me, cheap. And I'm going to start with a story. So a coworker of mine a few years ago wrote a, uh, a function that took a single precision floating point number and returned an enumeration value. If you, if you guys are familiar with FP classify, you can think of it as he's writing FP classify because it was something like that. It returns information about is this zero, is this positive, is this negative, is this denormalized, is not a number, is it infinity, so on and so forth. And he was, we were sitting around and he was saying, so what should I do to test this? I mean, obviously I want to test positive zero, negative zero, one, negative one, 10, 100, minus 10, whatever, positive infinity, negative infinity, some of the NANDs. And I said, oh yeah, don't forget the new, all the denormalized ones and so on. And we talked about this for a while. And then somebody came up with a bright idea and said, you know, there's only 4 billion possible single precision floats. You should just test them all. And he's like, huh, yeah, I wonder how long that'll take. And so he did. And it took about 20 minutes. <laughs> it took him about 10 minutes to write the test and about 20 minutes to run it. And fuzzing is kind of built upon that, the idea that we are awash in CPU cycles these days. I mean, this machine has which is a, an i5 at 3 gigahertz or something like that, has an amazing amount of CPU cycles. And most of the time, even when I'm working hard on it, it's pretty idle. Um, there are piles and piles, clouds if you prefer, of CPU cycles out there just waiting to be used if you want to write a check. Um, so CPU cycles are cheap. So the idea about fuzzing is you generate random inputs and you give them to the code you want to test and see what happens. And you just you do this over and over and over again and wait for the code to misbehave. Um, early fuzzers, like 10, 12 years ago, did exactly this. They just threw random inputs at the code it test and um, sees what happens. Um, a long time ago, and I was in the security team at Qualcomm, um, company showed up to give us a demo. They had uh, developed their own fuzzer and had uh, fuzzed a whole bunch of Bluetooth implementations. And what they had done was they called the interesting test case out of, their, out of this you know, billion and billion element random sequence that they tried. And they, they kept like the, the best 200 of them. And they showed up and said, we, we can help you find bugs in your Bluetooth implementation. And said, would you like to demo? Sure. Can we borrow a phone? Put the phone down on the table and said, OK, we're going to send our first test case to the phone. Wait five seconds. Is the phone dead? No. Second one third one. And on the 13th one, the phone crashed. <laughs> um, like I say, early Bluetooth stacks had lots of problems. Anyway, um, but as you think about it, there's a lot of possible test cases, right? How many zero byte inputs are there? One. How many one byte inputs are there? OK, 256, fine. Two byte <laughs> inputs, you guys know these numbers. You guys know powers of two. But anyway. So, but before we get to that, let's, let's step back and say, you know, what can, you're trying to do, when you're trying to do your, with fuzzing, you're trying to give uh, your code some random input and, and watch for it to misbehave, okay? What makes it easier to detect when something misbehaves? What you don't want is you don't want your, your program to say silently corrupt the heap, but return a sensible answer. You want to know when that happens, and how can you do that? Well, we have lots of good tools for that today that aren't directly related to fuzzing, but they make fuzzing better. Um, testing against debug builds that are filled with assertions. Um, this is great, right? You can, um, you can instrument your code uh, to a fairly well, 
and have it tell you when it says, I didn't ever expect it to be in this situation. And that helps you identify fuzzing test cases where your code is not doing the right thing. Um, sanitizers. How many people here are not familiar with the sanitizer built into Clang and GCC? One. You can come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, fuzzing a sanitized build is really, really handy because, you know, boom, things, you know, sanitizers will kill your program dead and say, look, right here, here was, here was the problem. Um, anything else? You know, the point is that you, the, the stuff you sanitize, you want it to have the same behavior as your code in production, but it can have extra stuff. So you can kind of go wild here. You, can, uh, you don't ever ship the thing you sanitize. You ship you know, something built without all these checks. And so you can, um, you can put in all sorts of code that, to verify that things are going well. Anyway, so early sanitizers, like I said, just did random, um, just generated random inputs and threw it at the wall and see what happened. And when you know, code had the problem of it being generally unreliable, um, then you f tended to find things. But this does not actually, you know, this seems kind of inefficient. And yeah, I said CPU cycles were cheap, but they're not free. And besides, you have no guarantees that this will actually find any interesting things in your code. And that's a problem. Okay? So there'd be whole chunks of your code that because of the way the random number generator you've chosen is implemented, it never generates any input that tests that. Um, that's a shame. Uh, so, so people came up with the idea of guided fuzzing. And in particular, the one that seems to have caught on is profile guided fuzzing. And profile guided fuzzing is you build your test program, your test code, with code coverage hooks in it that, that you know, that like GCUB and so on will, uh, can read. And what happens is you, you build your test code <coughs> with code coverage in, in the, um, after each input, the fuzzer will look at these code coverage results and use it to, use that to, do, to help figure out how to permute the input for the next test case. And the good thing about this is if you let it run long enough, it eventually will figure out how to, to get to and exercise all of the reachable code paths in your code. And so you can, you can see, you could get some confidence that you don't have any really, really strange behaviors in your code. Um, several years ago when this was new, um, one of the, the guided fuzzers that I'm going to talk about, um, AFL, um, was tried to fuzz a program that read JPEG files. So fine. So it started with a one byte file. It contained a null. Gave it an, and the test program said, that's not a <coughs> valid JPEG file. So it tried something else. That's not a valid JPEG file. That's not a valid JPEG file. That's not a valid JPEG file. And finally it hit on, by random, it hit on the idea of putting a 255, an FF, as the first byte of the file. And it got back, that's not a JPEG file, but it went through a whole different set of paths in the code, in, in the code, in the code. And this profile guided fuzzer noticed that and started generating more examples with 255 as the first byte. And it kind of got farther and farther through the code. And over a period of about four days of continuous running, this, this profile guided fuzzer that knew nothing about JPEG files managed to generate valid JPEG files. <laughs> and they were nothing like any other software on this planet ever generated. They, they were syntactically valid. Okay, but you know, it's an image that's like <laughs> this and it's, and the data was, has no recognizable, you know, there was not a recognizable image in there, but it was a valid JPEG file. And it did this over, you know, over and over. Yes? Did you describe a neural network? Yeah. Okay, I described a neural network. Yes, there's a lot of similarity there. But there's a similarity there to, uh, in techniques, yes. But basically the goal it, with this is to you know, exercise all the code paths in your, um, in your code. Now, for, a file, for reading a file format like JPEG, okay, the overwhelming majority of the inputs that are going to this are going to get rejected as, that's not a valid JPEG file. But that's fine because 
JPEG readers get corrupted JPEG files. They get malformed. If they're public facing things, they might get maliciously crafted JPEG files that are designed to cause the, the parser to misbehave so as to induce an, you know, an attack or to attempt an attack. Um, these, you know, these kind of things have to be really solid. And so this is one way to do that because nobody wants to sit there and, and try and write a million different invalid JPEG files and nobody has really has the creativity to do that in interesting ways. So we, we kind of do a random walk. So is this all clear to everybody? Oh. I was going to say, wait, that's not mine, is it? No. <laughs> so I got to tell you, just based on, based on past pre presentations, there is one thing that is more embarrassing than to have your phone go off while you're sitting in a presentation, and that is to have your phone go off while you are giving the presentation. <laughs> it's like, what? No. I can't talk now. Anyway, okay. So let's talk about individual fuzzers. There are three of them that are, have gained a lot of traction <laughs> recently. Um, well, I suspect that most of you will know about one or maybe two of them and not so many about the third one. So we'll start with American Fuzzy Lop, or AFL for short. For those of you who, don't, who, who are not um, animal husbandry uh, aficionados, American Fuzzy Lop is the name of a, of a breed of rabbit. It's fuzzy, okay? Anyway, from there, what, excuse me. And I have at the end, by the way, I, ha I will have links to all of these products that I'm talking about. Um, American Fuzzer is a security-oriented fuzzer that employs a novel type of compile time instrumentation and genetic algorithms to automatically discover clean, interesting test cases that generate new internal tests. That's a long way of saying what I said, but that's okay. Um, and it does a really good job. Um, Chandler, actually, sorry, that's the next one. I was going to say, the next, not AFL, but the, the next library I'm going to talk about. But how does it work? It generates test files. You know, the, the, the JPEG example I gave you was from AFL. It generates test cases. It writes them to file. It calls a program. It sees that the program crashes. <coughs> and if it does, it remembers that input as, hey, I found something interesting and then goes on to the next time. If it doesn't crash, it reads the coverage information and uses that to figure out where to go next. Um, anyway, American Fuzzy Lop, if you go to their webpage, they have a basically a, a trophy wall, which is things that they've found bugs in. And it is quite extensive. Um, not just libjpeg, but I mean, a lot of file format things, a lot of networking um, test programs. OpenSSH, OpenSSL, all sorts of interesting things. Um, what was nice about AFL, and actually all, all of these, is that once they find a input that misbehaves, they will attempt to, re to reduce it for you, sometimes with more success than others. Um, I have used these to fuzz libc++'s regex implementations. And at one point, I got a reduced test case. It's, this regex causes a stack overflow. And the reduced test case was 346k. <laughs> that was a regex. <laughs> and I, I tweeted this out kind of ruefully, like, this is a reduced test case. And, and Michael, Michael Case, who is not in this room, so I can tell stories about him. <laughs> Um, said, I said, I, I, get to, I get to debug this, this 346k regex. And he said, I used to think it would be cool to be you. <laughs> Did you fix it? I'm sorry? Did you fix the bug? Yes. And it turned out it was, it was not anything specific about that regex. That regex tr triggered a, just a, a, a very, a worst case <laughs> performance in, uh, in uh, libc++ regex, but it could have been anything, any very, very large regex. That was just one of the smaller ones that did it. So if you had, you know, a two megabyte regex, you'd probably see it no matter how, what you had in the regex. Anyway, um, AFL. 
So if you have, if you have set stuff set up for, um, for reading stuff from a file, AFL is a great solution. Um, another one, libfuzzer. Libfuzzer is built into Clang, because we're out of the LLVM project. It says libfuzzer is an in-process coverage guide evolutionary fuzzing engine. <coughs> Lots of buzzwords. And how does it work? It works by calling a procedure which you write and basically says, process this data and, and, and then it watches to see if that, that function misbehaves. Um, same general idea as AFL, but a different mechanism. It, instead of writing a file and, and spawning a new, a new process, it does it in process. In process. Okay? If, you're, if your test case, your, your sample code breaks, you know, crashes, misbehaves, it notes that and starts again. Um, because it's in process, it doesn't have to start, it doesn't have to write a file, it doesn't have to start a new process. Um, this allows libfuzzer to be much, much faster than AFL. On the other hand, <coughs> you know, it's technically possible for, you know, a bug in your program to go out and, and mess up, you know, a wild read or write, uh, possible for it to mess up libfuzzer's internal data structures. So, meh. Um, anyway, <laughs> libfuzzer is very nice. Um, I use it a lot. Let's look at an example. Here's a skeleton for libfuzzer. This is what you write, okay? If you want to use libfuzzer, this is what you write. This is, this is, all, this is the boilerplate, okay? You, get, you write an extern C function that gets a pointer to some bytes and a size. And you do something with this. And then you return zero, always return zero, because uh, returns of non-zero are, re are reserved for future use by the fuzzer. But all you do is you write this, and you, you know, <coughs> something in here, something you want to test. And I'll have an example later. I'll show you how, actually, we do that next. And then you just build it. Clang plus plus G01, F sanitize fuzzer, just like that. Um, you, you might want to add other fuzzers. You can add address sanitizer and and UB sanitizer and so on here, your file. Clang will now build, generate an executable that has all the fuzzing infrastructure all set up to call this, and then you just run it. Um, I have an example here. Okay, so let's start with, okay, here is my Fuzzer. There's a little bit that's scrolled off. The, the, the part that's scrolled off is include algorithm. Let's see if I can. There we go. So what do we see here? Include algorithm. Dun, 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 dun. If size is zero, return zero. We don't care about zero byte inputs. We just say, yeah, we're fine with zeros. Okay, now I'm going to. I'm going to grab the first byte, and then I'm going to call find. From the starting at the second byte, going to the end, looking for the, say the value that was the first byte. All right, this is a really simple test. I'm fuzzing std find. Okay, so now that I've done that, has it missed? You know, did it crash or anything? Because if it, if it crashes, you know, I won't get past here and libfuzzer will in fact say, huh, okay, uh, it crashed. That's good to know. But assuming it doesn't crash, we want to check that it did something sane. Okay, if, if the position, the iterator that returned is not the same as the end iterator, I want to assert that the thing that the, uh, the return value pointed to is in fact equal to val, right? That it found what I asked it to find. And then I also run from the first up to that position and assert that none of those are equal to val, that it found the first one. Okay, and then I return zero. Now in this one, now I'm pretty confident about std find, okay? I, and if I fuzz it, I suspect it will go a long time if not finding anything. So in this one, I even put a bug in here. I said, assert that the size is not 63. Because otherwise I could start this and we could watch stuff scroll by for 24 minutes, <laughs> 23 minutes now, 
Anyway, just watch it go by and by and by. But I'm not going to do that. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this. <coughs> TOT Clang is, is an, an alias I have for a Clang I just built. Actually, I built it a week ago. Anyway, dash G for debug symbols, f sanitize fugger, fuzzer address, find.cpp. Done. And then we'll, we'll run this. And it goes on for, that was quick. So let's see what, see what it says. It says, it starts up, and it says receive, and load stuff, and it's doing, ka -ding, ka -ding, ka -ding, and it's trying things, and it's trying things, and it's trying things. And it says, assertion failed, size not 63, file there, 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 um, fuzzer desi signal, I've got a, I have a stack trace here, and it tells me what the output is. It's crash has been written, test data is written to crash blah, and we can actually look at this if you want. Can I type? Yes, I can type. And you see that this is the crash data. This is the data it sent. And you see that it's 63 bytes long. And if you think about what the code was, it's going to be looking for a, a line feed. And did it actually find one? Does it matter? No. It doesn't appear to have any other line feeds in there. <coughs> but the point is, is the assertion went off that said the size is 63. And, but you, now you have a test case, and you could you could build up a test program, let's go back, and that, um, that called this, you know, that loaded up data and called it, and you could load it in a debugger and trace down and find out, oh yeah, it's got an assertion in it. <laughs> but the point is, is it's, it's, it's found something where it misbehaved and it has given you a test file that says this is what caused the, the misbehavior. All the other tests, how many tests were there? I don't know, hundreds. Um, it hasn't kept because the program did not dis misbehave. <coughs> anyway, that's a real simple example of um, using libfuzz to fuzz things. Anyway, um, did I? Yeah. Sorry. Just a sec. Um, Chandler de demonstrated libfuzzer here, I think, three years ago against OpenSSL in an evening session. And he, all he did was he took the data and he sent it to OpenSSL asking for like an inf the info um, response without actually trying to set up an encrypted channel. And he found Heartbleed in like 30 seconds. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the, the tricky part of these is actually figuring out <coughs> this. Okay, this is non, not obvious. But I have a more complicated example doing another um, libc++ thing. Um, this is going to test partition, std partition. Okay? So I have some data. I get data in size. I make a copy of it into a vector. And then I partition the vector according to some predicate. In this case, the simple predicate is it's even. Okay, so there, I've done all the work. Has it crashed? No. Hooray. Good. Partition works, at least in some cases. And now I say, but you know... I really want to know, is, is partition not just crash, not crashing, but also, has it done what it's supposed to do? And so what, is, what does partition do? It partitions a sequence into two, two groups. From begin in, to the return value here are all the things that satisfy the condition, the, the predicate. And from iter to the end are all the things that don't. So I want to test that. I say, all of the things from begin to iter are even. None of the things from iter to the end are even. And then I say, you know, I'm being real paranoid here, right? I want to know that we have all the same elements <laughs> here. That the that, that partition didn't like erase a three and put a six in there or something like that. <laughs> So I call is permutation, I say, is data, data plus size a permutation of the current state of the vector? And these are all, and, and you know, if these don't, don't, aren't true, the assertions will go off and I'll, it will drop a test case. Great, and then return zero, because we always return zero. So any questions about this? 
Yes, Michael. Um, so, so Lip Fuzzer is feeding data through this like U S A array with right. size of Bulbar, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, like the example that you show, it seems like you're using U S A with algorithms, and that works out pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. um, but if I have like some type, like it, I probably can't just like regular cast this raw bytes and like try to test. No, but if you have some other type, you, you, yeah, you're right. Your question is, you're getting a sequence of bytes here, right? And this works out really well for my examples because I sort or I find, search a sequence of bytes or I partition a sequence of bytes. But if you have some class, you can't just you know, reinterpret cast this pointer to be a pointer to your class. Absolutely not because you, know, you have invariance, I hope. Yeah, exactly. um, so this is where the cleverness comes in. You have to decide when you're writing this code here, you have to decide how you're going to interpret this data, how you're going to use this data to test your class. And sometimes it's not trivial. Um, sometimes it requires a lot of cleverness. Um, but that's what you write in here. You write in there and then you do something, you do something with this data, something related to what you want to test. And then make sure it does sensible things. Mm -hmm. types or transform it into yeah your domain yeah <coughs> and then you know you create create one of your objects here from this data somehow right, yeah. and then test that it's sane right. so um, I could like reinterpret caps into a struct that just has the values that I want to use for testing it would depend on your struct the question is can you just reinterpret this to a struct that has the values that you want for testing possibly it would depend yeah, on what yeah, your struct just, looks like yeah just not the class under test but mm -hmm. Yes, you could do that. Um, yes, for sure. Does this run in multiple threads by default? Does this run in multiple <laughs> threads? Uh, I don't believe that Liz Buzzer does by default. Um, but I don't know. I haven't looked closely enough to see. Also, this has one input. Are there versions with n inputs? Well, what you can do is you, if you, you, can, you have size inputs, really. And so you can split this up however you want. Like the name of the function is buzzer test one input. Yeah, so okay, one input. Ah, I see what you're saying. I do not believe that, that at present this has two inputs or three inputs or four inputs or n inputs. Lisa. So I, I want to point out there's kind of an obvious way to use this to test your deserialization code mm -hmm. by deserializing byte streams. Once you have deserialization code mm -hmm. for your class, you have a way to turn a data stream into your class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You could you 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 take this and you use it. Yeah, if you you deserialize it into a class and and you can yeah you do a whole bunch of tests or you can just serialize it back out again and compare the compare the byte streams. I mean along the way as well. Other questions? Yes. Um, I assume we have random pointers and random sizes being thrown in. Oh yeah. So how do we guard against <coughs> running up memory going towards? The block, so the question is, I, you, assume, you assume that you get random pointers and random sizes in here. You, you, you do know that data through data plus size, that this range is valid. Oh, SZ, SZ, not size. I edited this late, sorry. Um, anyway, anyway um, so how do you guard against whatever this is, reading random data, or writing random data, and so on? The sanitizers come in with that. Um, address sanitizer will, in fact, kill your program dead and say, you read random memory here. This is one of the reasons I like building with san address sanitizer. Yes? I think the point, though, is that the, the data is what is being randomized, not the arguments of the function. Yeah, <laughs> the contents of this array, vector, whatever. This, this sequence of bytes are what's being randomized between different calls. OK? Yes? Is there a way to get some kind of seed input as in start with this and then plug from there? Yes, there is. The question is, is, is there a way to, to um, give it a sample input and say start from here? Yes, you can give it. Um, you, let's go back a little bit. Here, you can say start with a particular data set you know, on the command line. You can say, or you can give it a corpus and say start from this corpus. Um, I didn't do that because this is, this is slideware. 
But as you saw, you know, it found, whoops, it, I'm sorry, you have to go back to the terminal. It found that assert. It, it, it figured out that, oh, I can send it a, a size of 63 and hey, there we go, I got a problem. Yes? Sure. Mm -hmm. So the question is, could you in fact um, put this in a file and pipe it to a different process for, for testing and so on? That way you, you have all the, all the sample data. That is exactly what AFL does, American Fuzzy Lop does. That is their, their mode of operation. You could do that here with libfuzzer. You could write in here something that sets it, back, sets it out to a file and, and spawns off something. But if you're going to do that, I would suggest using AFL because that's what it's designed to do. This is designed to stay in process just because it's so much faster. Okay, so let's just see a show of hands. How many people had heard about AFL before? Many of you. Okay, how many people knew about libfuzzer? More, that's interesting. Okay, how about OSS fuzz? How many people know about OSS fuzz? Way fewer hands. Okay, let's talk about OSS fuzz. OSS fuzz implements fuzzing as a service. It runs on Google's Compute Cloud and it continues, will continuously fuzz uh, your code. It's designed for fuzzing of open source packages and it's free. Uses the same libfuzzer interfa the in process interface as libfuzzer does. You know what the cool thing about that is? Is that you can, you can write your fuzzers, your fuzz testing stuff, fuzz them locally for a while, and then tell OSS fuzz about it, and they will go off and fuzz it forever. Um, anyway, you have to provide instructions on how to get your open source package, how to build it, um, and some kind of content, how to get in touch with you. Okay, and what, the, what OSS Fuzz does will will pull your code onto their systems. Uh, think it's you know x86 Linux in a Docker container. We'll build it and start fuzzing it. And in an ideal world, if we all wrote perfect code, there would be no need for this. In a slightly less ideal world, where you're the only one who writes perfect code, you sign up for this, <coughs> and nothing will happen. They'll fuzz this and fuzz this and not find any bugs ever. But in the real world, in the real world, what will happen is they'll find something and you get an email that says, we have, an open issue, we have opened an issue in our bugzilla. Here's a link to the issue. Here's information about what we did. Here's a link to download the test case. Here's, here's the failure we saw, whether it was, you know, uh, uh, a, you know, some kind of uh, <coughs> random read, or you ran out of memory, or whatever. And you go look at this test case, and you figure it out, and you test it, and you, you implement a fix in your open source project, and you commit it, and you go on with your life. And they will pull the updated code in without any, any, thing, any work on your part, and close the Bugzilla issue. Again, without anything, uh, without any work on your part. Um, the nice thing for security-related bugs is that they are they keep the, this bugzilla the bugzilla entries private for 90 days. It gives you a chance to find them, to discover what's going on, and fix them, <laughs> and then they're made public, so that er people can know that uh, there's a problem with this. Um, OSS Fuzz will also will give you a report. Um, if your program takes, if your snippet takes um, too long to run or uses too much memory, they consider 25 seconds too long to run and using two gigabytes of memory as being, that's enough. If you try to use more than two gigabytes of memory, you'll get a bug report that said, you used too much memory. Yes? Does it also work on pull requests? For example, assuming that I'm the guy who writes perfect code and everybody else makes Thing. Yes. I'd like to be informed when someone tells me it's time to do a pull request with a bug. Um, do, it does not work on pull requests. The question is, does it work on pull requests that aren't actually committed to your 
to your um, project yet. And no, it does not. It, they, although I believe you <laughs> could set it up so that they would pull from a particular branch. But the point of this is this is, this is meant to be a long-term kind of thing. You, the kind of thing you set up and then every now and then you, they say, hey, we found something. Or you know, just let it run. Um, but this, this is a huge boon. I, anybody from Google here? All right, well, thanks to Kostya and all the rest of the people at Google on the, uh, the tools teams, because this is a huge boon to the open source world. Um, I have been fuzzing various things in libc++ for the last several months. This is a list of the, the, the things I've been fuzzing. This is, to my mind, this is a good start. Um, sort, all the sorting stuff, um, all the heap stuff, all, you know, partition and mfilm, all the sort, I mean, you guys know this, there's like seven different sort algorithms in the standard library, anywhere from stable sort, sort, um, nth element, partial sort, partial sort copy, and so on. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Anyway, they've all been fuzzed to a fairly well. Um, we haven't found any bugs in all of these. The regex stuff, on the other hand, um, the problem is with regex is it's basically a complete language and it's open-ended. So I have a lot of out-of-memory errors and things that take longer than 25 seconds to run and so on like that. And so I get a lot of reports, you know, a lot, a couple every week about new things they found that take, you know, two gigabytes of memory. <laughs> like the one I said, you know, 346K is a reduced test case. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of out-of-memory timeouts, but several actual real bugs in our regex implementation. So um, this has been well worth doing to me for me, and I'm going to continue do. Whoops, I'm going to continue doing it, and I'm going to be adding to this. This is one of these things where every now and then, when I am avoiding other work, because oh, I don't want to work on that, I'll go pick a couple more things in the in libc++ and add them to. OSS fuzz, yes? On the, the practical, like, how do we apply this random data to our test case kind of thing, I'm thinking of Red X, we probably have some portion of it. This is where I am. Okay, with the Red X, you probably have some portion of it that is the stream that is being searched, and some portion of it that is the regular expression itself. How do you, what do you decide to do? What did I do? I said, I got all this data here, I'm going to make a Red X out of it. Okay, so the whole thing is a Red X. And then I'm going to try to tell it to match it against itself. Um, I could have been more clever, sure. but it's not clear to me that that would have made it made the testing better. Right. So there's there's lots of ways to do this, and um, I I went to the very basic one, because you know constructing a regex could fail, right? You can have an open paren and no closed paren or anything like that. So in this here where in this test case for regexes, I have to actually try construct the regex, catch the exception, and that's fine, if the, right? And then if, it, if the su construction succeeds, then I try to match. And that might fail too. And it might throw an exception as well. Okay. So yeah, there's this, this is where the cleverness comes in, is deciding how to interpret this data. Right. I mean, I have people at work who said, yeah, I want to fuzz this library. I say, great, this is the interface. What, do you want, what are you going to do with this data? Anyway, um, <coughs> libfuzzer, lib OSS fuzz, anyway. Um, OSS fuzz and boost. I've just gotten started on this. Uh, I'm trying to uh, fuzz some of the things in boost algorithm with this. But what I'm trying, what I'm working on at the moment is a general boost-wide way to interface with OSS fuzz. Okay. Um, in general, what I'd like to be able to do is for people just to to put some metadata in their library, as well as a bunch of these things and then have OSS fuzz pick them up automatically. And that's what I'm working towards. It's not there yet. I'm not even sure exactly what kind of um, form it will take. Um, but it will the individual library authors will have to write the test cases, because I'm not going to write them all. And I don't know enough about HANA to write test cases. Maybe HANA doesn't even fit this, because it's all at compile time. Yeah. But anyway. Um, they have to, probably have to provide build instructions for 
um, libraries that are not header only. But the rest, the, I, the goal is that all the rest of this setup should happen automatically. And I'm hoping that sometime this summer, I will have something ready to show. Okay, and questions? Because that's the end of my slides. Yes? Uh, is it, have you used this to uh, get reduced test cases when a, suppose a user re reports a bug in your library and you say, oh, this user doesn't know how to reduce the test case. Can I use a puzzle to reduce it? Um, I have not tried that. The question is, can you, use, can you use one of these fuzzers to reduce a test case and, where basically you have a test case um, and can you use this to say, oh, this is going to crash, can I, can I reduce it? And usually when I, get test, when I get bug reports from people that include test cases, they're not a sequence of bytes. They're, they've got some structure to them, right? They're, they're you. And so I haven't tried that at all. It's possible that you could do that because you go, you start here and you say, you know, start with a particular corpus. But I haven't even, I hadn't, that hadn't even occurred to me. So I haven't tried it. Who was first? Well, I just had a comment. Okay. I think ASL has a standalone tool that if you do have that sequence of bytes, you can ask ASL to reduce that sequence of bytes for you to the same test case. I'm almost positive. Okay. So what Jason has said is that, that he believes that uh, AFL has, uh, has the ability that if you have something, something that crashes that they will that have a tool that will let you reduce it. Yes, David. Um, the, the OFS fuzz uh, uh -huh. thing, do you have to provide your own uh, uh, tester implementation? This, uh, this? Yeah. yes, you have to write your own one of these. It's the same interface, the same behavior as libfuzzer which is kind of unsurprising because it came out of the same tool <laughs> team at Google. But um, yeah, you have, you have to determine how you're going to interpret this stream of bytes and what tests you're going to run. Michael. Um, so I was going to ask about like, the AFL uh -huh. interface. Is it similar to this? Oh, the AFL interface is you, you, you make a program that reads a file from disk. But conceptually, it's still a stream of bytes. Yeah, yeah, in terms of like, interpreting raw bytes and being clever with it. It's yes. Still, it's um, conceptually, it's the same thing. And do you st are you still using AFL to like test libc++ or is it lib libfuzz? I'm using I'm using libfuzzer because a it's much faster and b you know I, I don't have any need for files. You know most of the things in libc++ work on objects, work on streams of bytes, things like that. I don't they don't work on files. And the, and the algorithm between AFL and libfuzzer are like They're similar. Uh, this, the, the question is, are the algorithms used in libfuzzer and, AF, and, uh, libfuzzer and AFL, are they similar? Um, I s believe they are very different internally, but they have the same general goal. So it depends on, you know, they will find different things. The nice thing about OSS fuzz is it uses both of them internally. Oh. Yeah. You were first, second. Mm -hmm. So what happens when I return 42? <coughs> what happens when I throw an exception? Well, if you throw an exception, the exce that will get treated as a crash, as a misbehavior. If you let if you let an exception escape from here, just like you know, just like well, I'm sorry, the one I had in the terminal where you, where it asserted, yeah. right? That's that's a crash. An exception escaping is a crash. And the reason you always return zero here is because the people who wrote libfuzzer said, said re reserve this for future work. You know, they want to be able to say, you know, at some point that, that non-zero returns will mean something, but not yet. <coughs> yes, David. Are there, are there any fuzzers that um, uh, understand uh, input formats and will fuzz with those? So like, let's say you are expecting XML or JSON, they'll send in stuff that's Valid JSON, but it's all the hidden values are. Um, I the question is, are there are there format specific fuzzers, basically fuzzers that, for example, understand JSON and generate syntactically valid but semantically weird JSON as a sequence, as you know, as a sequence of inputs. 
I don't know of any, but I suspect that there are people working on that. Um, one of the things that I would love to do with this is to fuzz network protocols, but then you need to actually embed in the fuzzer a knowledge of the network protocol so it can go three steps down the network protocol and then go sideways and try to break things. Um, anybody want to talk about the, fuzz, the, the formatting, the format thing? Yes. Yeah. Oh, cool. And which one is that? The libfuzzer? OK, I haven't tried that with libfuzzer. Great. The question, comment was that in libfuzzer, you can provide your own evolution function, which, which the, um, the fuzzer will call to help figure out how to generate the next test case. OK, Did, uh, great. I learned something. Um, I, we had, just a second ago, I had three hands up, and now I have none. I'll give you one more. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you uh, do you effectively have like a try catch dot 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 because you don't care if an exception is thrown, you just care if there's an actual memory error crash of some sort? Um, no, I I usually catch the things that that um, say the regex constructor is documented to throw. Okay. And things if it throws something else, that's a crash. That's a misbehavior. That's a crash. Okay. That's what I want to. That's what I want to find. And it's usually that's you know it's stood regex error and there's and there's a bunch of those. Right. Michael. Um, so what I'm going to say is that for the formatted stuff mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like producing JSON and stuff, it seems like it would be pretty nice to uh, be able to write libraries for it because you could take this random bytes and you know kind of wrap wrap your own formatting around the raw data, mm -hmm. um, and people have the power to just write libraries on top of it. So that yeah. So Michael's comment was, you know, people could write, write layers on top of this that takes, that interprets this as, say, j that, that turns this into, you know, syntactically correct JSON. Although, speaking of JSON, JSON and JSON, JSON and I were discussing this last night at dinner, because um, he was trying, he had fuzzed a, uh, a JSON engine. Scripting right? Scripting, scripting your scripting engine, right, that ate that ate JSON, and I pointed out to him that, you know, he said that yeah, most of them are invalid, invalid token sequences or invalid UTF-8 sequences, and I said, yeah, but you know, if your if your services is out on a um, a public-facing web server, there are people all over the world who would love to send you invalid <laughs> sequences just to see what happens, to see if they can get your server to misbehave enough so that they can get it to do something that they would like. And so this is, this is a lot of what this fuzzing is good for, is hardening. That's why I chose the uh, um, making your library more reliable or hardening your library so that, that even if people give it completely nonsensical input, you do something sane, like return an error. Say, I don't even want to try with this. OK, uh, we are ooh, 10 minutes over. Um, any other questions? OK. Um, Links to all three of the packages I discussed. Thank you. <laughs>